I guess the first thing we should do is maybe uh, we'll start with you, Lisa, if you want to introduce yourself and uh, maybe kind of just briefly explain how you got into this industry um, because I think everybody gets into it by accident. So if, if I could just kind of, you know, we'll start from there. I'm Lisa Moy. Um, in this group, I'm probably the outsider because I do more television entertainment and sports work. I've done a few conventions, a few AV shows, but mostly my career is in the television industry. I started in this career, as you say, strictly by accident. I used to run the rental department at Walt Disney World. Believe it or not, they had a rental department. And I was in charge of keeping track of all the cameras. When we opened the Disney Studios, there was a big hole in the wall for utilities and people that understood how cameras were set up and how television shows ran. And I jumped right in and put myself in that position, and it hasn't stopped. And how long ago is that, if you don't mind me asking? Over 35 years. Wow. So you've seen a lot of changes in the industry. I've gone from tube cameras to fiber optic digital cameras. Wow. A never a dull moment. Never. Well, great. Um, Deb? Uh, so I'm Deborah Myers, and um, I've been in the industry for 19 years and 23 years overall in hospitality and meetings. Also um, kind of got into the business by accident. I was working for two different uh, destination management companies. Prior to that, I had been at Universal Studios in the VIP Tours Department. And um, I had um, meetings experience working with the DMCs. Um, but I found that I kind of got bored after about two years working for a company um, and I just was looking around for the next, um, you know, uh, thing that I could do to keep me interested. So um, I, not at the time was my husband, but his roommate was a teleprompter and I bugged him for many years to train me because I felt I had the right background. I also, like Allison, have a theater background. So I felt I had the right skill set, and one day he needed somebody, and he trained me. And then it kind of snowballed from there, and I do, now I do teleprompting, graphics, audience response systems, and most recently, uh, stage managing. And I've been doing that about four years. Cassandra. All right, um, I grew up on a farm, and one of the workers there was a rigger, a tour rigger. And so that planted the seed in the beginning, and then I went to college to become a music teacher. A uh, student taught one class with kazoos and decided that I was done. Um, I give teachers all the props in the world. So one of the guys at the college actually came up to me and said, you should, you should do audio, you should do video. And he gave me a bunch of equipment and, and said, I need you to come up with this video, this concept, we're gonna do a rock opera. And if you can come up with this and, and you can show up with this, then, then you have the job. And, and it's the worst video I've ever seen in my life looking back now. <laughs> but at the time I was like, this is the best thing ever. Um, and I got into video and I actually got into rigging so I do video, I do rigging, I'm, I do audio and lighting. I kind of do a plethora of things. But uh, my main passion is, is video switching, graphics, and, and rigging. And you're out of Fort I'm Myers, I'm out of correct? Fort Myers, Florida. Wow. And do, you, do any of you remember your first gig and what that was like? Was it scary? Um, you know, how did, how, did you get into it by accident? And uh, once, you got, you know, once you got through your first gig, were you hooked? Um, what was that feeling like the first time you were on show site? My first show was pretty much, it was a grand opening, I think, of Epcot Center. And they're like, we have these many concerts, this has to happen, this has to happen. And it never even phased me what was going on until it was all over. Uh, I was absolutely terrified, I'm not ashamed to say. I'm a perfectionist and um, I wanted everything to be absolutely perfect. Um, and I was absolutely terrified knowing that I was going into a live show situation where basically I could make or break the show if I messed something up. Um, but uh, for, in acting, they say if you're not nervous, then you should quit. And I kind of feel like it's the same thing. I feel like I'm nervous because I care and I want to do a good job and I want the show to come off well. Um, and I want my clients to have a successful meeting. And so I have kind of found a way to channel that nervous energy into just, you know, being excited about doing a great job and, and showing my value and, and in, in turn allowing the clients to show their value to their attendees. I was cocky. I gotta be honest, I was, I probably I should have been nervous that. my first gig. <laughs> I probably, 
I am actually more nervous now that I know ignorance is bliss in this industry. The key is not to look nervous. That, the key is not to look nervous. We're all yeah, nervous, but I'm sure we all look And it worked great until something cool went wrong. Here, right? and I was like, there's a little good. man upstairs catching fire up there. Exactly. And you were like, no, I got this, guys. When does the show start? Um, I don't remember my first show, other than the rock opera, which was awesome. Um, but I did a lot of, of, of theater, and I think at that time. Now, went into it. And you all are, are technically freelancers, correct? So nobody's working full time. And um, I think that's one of the unique things about the, the AV industry is most people that are in it work on a freelance basis. So I think that gives people a lot of freedom, uh, it allows them to um, test out new things. Mm -hmm. Maybe they work full time, maybe they work part time. Um, how have you adapted to the freelance life? You know, what, what, what's that like? Because that's something that isn't suited for everybody, but I think there's a lot of things in the AV industry that gives you a lot of freedom. I mean, Deb, you, you mentioned that you're going to London with your husband to do a gig. Um, yes. What's, what's it like kind of being a freelance tech? I mean, it can be very, very scary um, not knowing when the phone will ring next time or if the phone will ring again. Um, that's certainly something that when you're first starting out, it really takes some time to get used to. Um, especially if you've come from a nine to five job and you're used to that paycheck on Friday, this is not that. Um, and it does take a little bit of an adjustment and a little bit of fore planning, um, you know, hoarding your money in the spring when, when gigs are plentiful and, you know, so that you'll have a little nest egg for the summer. It, it takes a little bit more forethought and planning. Um, but it is very, very doable. I, I do think, though, maybe we can address this later, this is one of the challenges that we have of getting people into this industry. Because for me, I hire other freelancers, but for me to say to someone, hey, quit your full-time job, I'm not promising you how much I can work you. Uh, that's very challenging to find somebody that has that availability. I think you need to find somebody that is, you know, maybe fresh out of school or maybe, you know, still living at home or they have a little bit of a safety net that they can fall back on if they're not, you know, booking a month's worth of gigs right off the bat. Because you're assuming, you're assuming that the work is going to come. Right. But most of the time it does. I actually have a friend right. that was recently laid off from his job. He was full time. And as soon as that happened, three days later, he was, he was doing shows. Mm -hmm. um, same thing happened to me when I was a full-time tech. Uh, I was laid off. Within a week, I was doing shows. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, you know, it's nice that you can, you know, get work when you need it. Mm -hmm. And also, you could relocate very easily, right? Like, if you wanted to move to the West Coast, sure. you could just move. And as long as you can get on a plane or get to an airport, you kind of have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. So um, you both have children, correct? Yes. So what, what's it like being a, a mother, a uh, female uh, um, with kids in this industry and, and balancing that out uh, for, for any women that might be looking at this and saying, well, I have kids, I definitely can't do it. And you're, you're smiling, so I'm guessing you have a good answer. No, I have, I have no good answer. It's like riding a bike <laughs> on fire answer. running down the road. It, you know, when I, I, wouldn't change, I wouldn't change my career for the world for my girls. I have a two-year-old that's going to be three in a couple days, and I have a 13-year-old. And they have, my 13 year old has lived through a lot with me. We have lived in Nashville. We have lived in Grayson, Kentucky. We have moved to Fort Myers. She has seen me 70 hours a week working and coming home and bringing her to ballet. Sitting there going, I can watch you do this. I know what you're doing right now. Well, I'm half asleep in the back of my head. My daughter has lived through a lot and I, and I will tell you this, it is doable and it is rewarding now that she is a teenager. And though she holds, I will say this, she holds a lot of things in resentment for me being gone for long hours, but now that she's a teenager and she's seeing it, she's realizing it's worth it. And, and I've made, I've, she's a very strong little girl and I wouldn't trade it for the world in the career that I picked, but it's a doable career. When I got my three-year-old, I stopped traveling as much. I, I stayed home and believe it or not, it picked up. Somehow when one door closes, another door does open in this industry. It tr I truly believe that because I stopped traveling, which cut my throat deeply but I said, I'm gonna be home with my daughter and somehow a company that was right down the road from me went, are you staying home? And I said, yeah, no, I'm, I'm here. They were like, let me pick you up. And now they're my largest client. Yeah, don't and move so, to Vermont if you wanna do this to, and, and be Vermont. home. You know, yeah. just to, <laughs> no, I mean, you could do it in Grayson, Kentucky. I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I, ne I never did a nine to five. I actually, my mom is standing or sitting right there. And I, and I got on. a nine to five job and I think a couple months into it, my mom goes, you are gonna quit. I don't care how much money you're making, you have no soul go back into freelancing, go back, do what makes you happy. And so I think honestly, like of, of mentors, I've had a lot of men mentor me and I am very grateful, but my mom has been a cornerstone a lot of times in my life that mom, I can't do this, I'm tired, my daughter, I gotta run here, I gotta get up at five o'clock in the morning, my daughter's walking to the bus stop, I gotta call this babysitter. 
it, it has all worked out and it's worth it. The industry is absolutely worth it. And taking two months off to go hiking with my daughter in New York this summer, two full months off as a single mom and, and hike and take her to have those experience is worth anything in the world to a nine to five that you are there 24 seven. And, and I would not change it for the world and I would tell my daughter to get into my industry. So your daughter knows that you're gonna be gone and you're working hard, but she also knows you're gonna be back and you're gonna be able to spend quality time with her. And I'm gonna be honest, my daughter her. sometimes goes with me and she checks out some pretty cool places. That's awesome. How about you, Deb? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, my nine-year-old is here, and uh, she <laughs> and um, she is. You know, I've, I've, I, we're all friends here, so I can tell you that I've nursed two children on site. Not had the kids with me, but you know, everybody's going to lunch, and I'm going with my special little bag to the ladies' room. You know. Um, so it is definitely challenging and you know those last minute school things pop up and you're already booked on something um, it does break your heart because of course you want to be there for your kids my nine-year-old I say hey I'm going on a plane tomorrow she says oh yeah whatever mom you know see you when you get back uh, my five-year-old's a little different he's not so accepting of it but he's getting there um, but uh, they do know that we have a lot of time that a lot of parents don't have. So in those times where they're sad we're gone or we're FaceTiming and, oh, when are you gonna be home, mommy? Oh, I miss you too, honey. Um, you know, we remind them, because my husband's also in the industry, which has its own set of special challenges um, with us both traveling, um, we remind them that most parents don't get to spend the whole summer with their kids, which is pretty much what we do. We you know, may do a gig here or there, but largely in the summer, um, we try to reserve that time for our kids, you know, and around the holidays as well, and most people don't have that. So we've, we've found ways to make it work, but I'm not gonna lie, it is very challenging. There's been plenty of times we've forgotten to give the babysitter the car seats, or the parents don't have the sign for the school, or this form didn't get sent in or whatever it is. It does have its challenges. Um, I think for me, uh, what helps me is that I compartmentalize. So when I'm at home, I'm fully there for my kids. I check my email maybe three, you know, three or four times a day to make sure I'm responsive to my clients, but I'm not looking at my phone every five seconds. Um, and when I'm on site, I, I leave it up to my caregivers to be responsible. If, if a problem arises, of course I'm always reachable, but I'm focused on the show and I'm fully there for my clients and I'm focused on what I'm doing. Um, and that seems to help me quite a bit. So I think uh, work-life balance is extremely important too, because especially when you're a freelancer, um, I think a lot of people when they start out, most start out young, they start out in their 20s, and I think you're, you're undisciplined because you, you know, well, at least when I was doing it, I'd have two weeks off and then you get that phone call, you know, you're ready to go on vacation, do something, and someone picks up and they say, hey, I got a 10 day gig in Vegas, and you just do the math in your mind and you're like, well, am I gonna put $4,000 on the table or am I just gonna, am I gonna go relax? And I feel like as a technician, the older that you get, the more you have to figure out how to balance that out. Like you can't always try to beat the amount of days you worked in 2017 in 2018. So have you all kind of found, you know, as you've, uh, you know, matured in life, let's say, had kids, um, taken on more responsibility that you've had to be more disciplined, especially in this um, really red hot AV market that we find ourselves in right now. If you're good, there's no shortage of work. So how do you stay disciplined? You take a certain month off every year, let everybody know that that's your month. And I've got certain clients that don't bother me during that month. And then any other time, I'm all theirs. My, my trick was to book the plane ticket. Like book it now <laughs> that, for January date, and then you can't. Make a date with somebody happen. you haven't seen for a couple of months. And you know, I have one friend to this day, I can go, I need work, call that person, make a dinner date. I guarantee you I'd get a call next day. Because I think when you're, when you're a little bit younger, you, you're like, well, I don't know if I want to give this job to someone else because what if, what if that person starts calling you know, uh, my colleague? But I think as you get older and you find, you, you're more confident and you're more, more established in your career, it's like, okay, I'm booked. Call so-and-so. I'm confident they'll do a great job. Uh, would, would you find that to be accurate? Yes, I, I think so. Um, this is something I, we still have problems with uh, because my husband and I are both very dedicated, very hard workers, and uh, we have trouble remembering to take care of ourselves and to set that time aside. And I think if it wasn't for our kids, we wouldn't be as good as we are at it 
uh, at this point, but I mean, there were years and years and years where all we did was work. And I've given away, I can't tell you how many sets of concert tickets um, and you know things that we had planned to do. And like you say, you'd start doing the math. Well, I have this seven day job or I could go to this one concert this night. And you know, it's really a no brainer <clears throat> at that point. Um, but I, I think as long as you know that you need to have work-life balance, then you can take those steps that you need to take to make sure. Um, and you can make little rules for yourself. My husband and I have a rule that we don't leave our kids more than seven days without one of us being there, without one of us seeing them, without one of us there, just to be a touchstone for them um, so that they don't feel like we just left and deserted them it is very, very, very rare if we're both out of the state at the same time. And it just works out that way. Um, and we're lucky we have really reliable childcare at this, this point in our lives. But when we first got married and we started talking about kids, this was a question we could never answer. How will we make this work? How will we pull this off? How are we going to be able to be there for our family? and? Um, work as much as we are and, and do what we're doing. Um, and people kept saying to us, oh, you'll figure it out. It'll all work out, don't worry. Um, but for someone like myself that wants to know those answers and wants to be prepared uh, up front and, and have that knowledge, it was very, very scary to take that leap. But the reality was is that it really did work itself out. And us being freelancers, we were able to control our scheduling. So, oh, got a text. Oh, got a job offer for this. Oh, well, we'll need a babysitter on this one day where we'll overlap. And so things like that, he'll, you know, he comes in the door as I'm walking out the door. And, um, you know, we pass each other in the sky sometimes on the airplane. Um, but we've, we've managed to make it work. And I'm, I, I gotta tell you, me from 20 years ago would not have have believed what I'm telling you right now, but but it is true, and we've done it. I had I had my daughter prior to this industry. I had my child young. I'm 33, and my daughter is 13. So you can do the math on that. So I can I can say in my heyday of 20s, I, I did pick up. I was a workaholic. I picked up any gig I could, got a hold of anything. I loved it. If I wanted a concert, if I wanted to go see it, I went. I'm going to call them, and I'm going to get on that concert. I'm going to rig that concert, and then I'm going to watch that concert. And then I'm gonna, they're going to pay me to do what I want to do. And that's honestly what I go into this industry as. You're paying me to play in a jungle gym. You're paying me to sit in these corporate events and watch these shows and learn a plethora of information. And, and it is a horrible work life. I have a horrible work life balance. I have learned in the last three years, my, my second child grounded me. And I learned in that moment that I needed to be home more with her. But I, I will tell you, it is, it's, it's easier said than done. And I'm still learning that work life balance. But I've learned to paddleboard. I've learned to take other classes at the gym. I've learned to do those healthy things and then incorporate my children with it. We FaceTime and do all that. And it's also something that you don't necessarily have to do full time. I have a no. friend who's a stay at home mother and she used to homeschool her kids and she would take camera gigs on the side mm -hmm. just to make a little bit of extra money. So, um, so you can fully commit and go, go all in and this could be your career. Or you can, you know, maybe you're into film and television and you need to pay some extra bills. Or maybe you're a stay at home mother and you just want to make some extra money and you can take a gig and if you turn it down it's not a big deal because maybe you're not the primary um, uh, earner in the household. So there's, there's flexibility I think on both sides. You can commit fully and make it a full-time job or you can use it to your advantage whenever you have some time available well, and, and the it's more a you skill learn, you can always fall back on. The more you learn, the, the more you can ask for and that's what I've learned. When you start off, sometimes you start as the bona fide box pusher is what I like to call it. We all end up being box you pushers. You have to. If At you the end of the day, you're, you're, you're a box pusher. Wrong, yeah. So I don't care how high up you are in the industry, you're going to push that box. But the more you get into it, if you can learn to budget yourself in a way to not live the materialistic life, you can go out on some of these jobs and pay your entire life in a week, depending on how you structure your life, when you start moving up in the industry. And so you can start taking that time and finding that work balance and going, it's worth giving up that vacation if I don't have to be away from my kids or away from friends. You don't necessarily have to have kids. Just to have an actual normal life where if a friend calls you up and says, let's go out, it's not, oh, I'm booked, or oh, they might call me, or I have to cancel on my girlfriends. My girlfriends know I disappear for a month well, at it's a also time. a traveling roadshow, so a lot of times oh, the yeah. people that you're go gigging with are friends, and they you go out having a drink after work, and it's it's this whole kind of social scene. Um, 
I think it's also a little bit about learning to say no, and I am the worst example of that. Um, but, you know, because you do just kind of get into this groove and you're like, oh, well, I just bought a puppy. I need to pay for that puppy. And I, you know, how am I going to do? Well, I better take this job. And um, my husband just texted me the other day. He's like, I got offered these two days. But if I take these two days, that will mean I'm working 18 days straight. And, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, I said, let it go. You know, turning down one job is not going to ruin your career, you know, and sometimes you just need to take a breath, take a beat and breathe and, um, and regroup, you know, and, and, and make sure you're fresh for the next one. And, but it's, it's a hard thing to do, you know, when you're in it because that, that favorite client calls or maybe somebody you've never worked for before, it's a new client. You really want to get that relationship going. It's a difficult thing to do, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to bite the bullet and, and do it. And sometimes you have to bite the bullet and just say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not available. I have found over, actually when I started with this, when I started traveling on a very regular basis, I was lucky enough to where I'd work a week, have two or three weeks off, work a week, have a couple weeks off. So I would incorporate a vacation mm -hmm. with every one of my travels. So literally when I say I've seen the country, I haven't seen a convention hall or a TV station or whatever show I was working on. I've seen Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. I've seen the hiking trails on the Appalachian Mountains. I get out there and leave the area that I was hired to work at, and I explore the national parks. If you do it right, you stay a couple extra days. I, I took a 19-day vacation after the Arizona Super Bowl, and I explored every square inch of the state of Arizona. Now, just real quick, what, what, what do you all think about like mentorship then? Because I feel like you know, in my career, I learned a lot. And I made a lot of mistakes, and I wish I could talk to like a younger version of myself and say, hey, these are the things I did right, these are the things I, I did wrong. Were you all mentored by anybody? Uh, and if so, do you see a value in mentoring younger people? Like if you, Deb, wanted to mentor someone that would be a good graphics operator or power, you know, PowerPoint operator, um, if you saw that person, would you say, hey, I want to try to teach you what I do? Because maybe when you're busy, you could steer the work towards them. And yes. I, I think one of the, the, the issues that we have in our industry is it's getting so busy um, that everybody that's good, even people that are okay, have no shortage of work. And there doesn't seem to be that influx of new talent that's coming in. And I think that's one of the questions that we're trying to uh, uh, pose here at Evolve is, it's easy to have a dialogue inside the industry. It's really hard to find someone that's working at you know uh, the computer store in the mall right now that would be an excellent projectionist or an LED tech, they have no idea that our, that our industry exists. So I guess part one would be, is mentorship important? And is that something that you would, you would think about doing in the future? And how do we get more people, and I guess more women, into our industry? Um, I do think mentorship is very, very important. Um, my female members of my family, of course, are great role models to me. They were great creative thinkers, and they definitely thought outside of the box. And I think that's um, a very good skill to have when you're in this industry is um, creative problem solving, because you never know what's going to happen or what you ordered, and then you open the box, and that's not what it is, and how are you going to make this work with, you know, to manage a client expectation. Um, a good, dear friend of mine uh, named Catherine Hayes, she's a meeting planner in town. She has a, a company called Global Event Team. She's been a huge mentor to me and met her about 20 years ago. And when I was working at Universal and she said to me, you know what, you'd be great at what I do. And at the time, she was working for a destination management company. And um, she pulled me in, and I went to work with her in a very junior capacity, and I learned a ton from her. She genuinely loves every client she works with. She loves her job, she loves what she does, and you know, travels the world. Um, I, the second part of that is I absolutely um, want to give myself as a mentor. I do this uh, for my kids. Uh, next month, I'm going to my daughter's school to do a teach-in day. And who knows, you know, what a little fourth grader might see um, my presentation and think, hey, that looks kind of neat. Let me find out more about that. Or, hmm, I can draw. Maybe I want to do graphic design or whatever. Um, so anytime I get an opportunity like that, I try to do it. But it doesn't need to be so formal, I don't think. 
Um, I talk to my daughter all the time about what happened at work today and I didn't handle this very well and here's what I probably should have done better or you know what happened to you today and what do you think you could have done um, to, to make things better and and I do meet women and people are referred to me all the time that, that say to me um, you know this girl is great but I, she just doesn't have a thing yet um, very recently we have a friend um, that is a teacher where does Jessica teach at UCF right and um, said to me I have this student that is amazing she is going to be fantastic and she's kind of interested in your industry would you meet with her absolutely and you know I had lunch with this girl and she is fantastic um, she's super polished she's super driven she's very very interesting in learning and growing as a person and professionally um, and you know I've now you know booked her several times and she's like clicking right along in the business and she's doing very well um, and I think you really have to I think that that as women um, but just as people we need to be lifting each other up and not saying you know well, I put you on this job and you did this wrong and you did this wrong and you, you know, I think it's like, hey, you were great when this happened, but let's talk about maybe what you could have said instead of, of this or that and, and kind of be nurturing and growing. Um, there's a, a philosophy that I've just started recently learning about um, called growth mindset. And there's a book, if you're interested, by a woman named Carol Dweck and it is just called mindset and I've seen it out in the corporate world quite a bit now they're using it they're also using it in schools and it is that mindset philosophy of you know you did this wrong you did this wrong and changing that to you don't know you're not great at this yet but how can we make you great and you know building up from a more positive perspective and I think that's what we need to be doing for some of these people that we do see they have a great foundation they have a great personality they have the right temperament maybe they just don't have the experience or the skills yet and to help those people along and to give them advice as to you know hey go talk to that person they are a wealth of knowledge and that would really be something that would help you out a lot excellent answer I, I couldn't ask for anything more thank you very much so so you've actually done mentorship which is amazing I have yeah <laughs> all right so we have uh, we have five more minutes so I just have two more quick questions and then we'll kind of throw it to the audience if anybody has a question um, so being a, a freelance technician so most people are freelance technicians uh, this one's I guess a little bit more for you Cassandra um, your business and sometimes you have to think of ways like okay next year do I raise my rate do I work harder what do I what do I do and um, it's kind of a business that you can grow in different ways and you've invested in yourself you've invested in some equipment some yeah. switchers so uh, how did that come about uh, was it a really hard decision and once you did it uh, did your customers kind of say hey I'd like to have you on my show and bring us bring some of the gear along as well and do you kind of see yourself more offering a service other than just um, labor let's say so I wish it was that Skill, thought out. Labels, <laughs> I wish, I wish it was that labor, thought I out. Um, I, I bought the S3 because Barco I wanted... Barco S3? The, okay. Yes, the Barco S3. bought the Barco S3. And uh, mainly because I wanted to give the clients that I worked for that had smaller shows an opportunity. This is what you can really do. And this is what we can really do with your show. And this is how we can move it forward. And if I, if I invested in myself, then they'll invest in me. And, and it actually worked full circle. I, am, I own graphics machines. I own playback machines. I'm not fully a rental business. It's more of me putting it out there and honestly to make more bang for the buck. If you're going to take me in, well, I have an S3 that you can come with. Oh, and by the way, I can take my graphics machines. And oh, by the way, I can actually preset your entire show. And I can have it ready. So when you walk in the door and I can get the projection up and everything else, now I've sold you the show and it's ready to go. I'm not coming on site and trying to program it. I've given you a different service. And so, and I've also learned, like this year has been really hard, you know, going out. It's not even on a woman's aspect. I feel like rates should be talked about, base rates maybe a little bit more because they always talk about cheapening the market and they always talk about this is, you're, you're gonna come in and, oh, you, you got paid this and you got paid that. And I go, yeah, why was I supposed to ask for more? Can I ask about this? And I realized in the long run, sometimes they'll hire you more when you hit that rate because then they're going, why is she not asking for that rate? 
well, what am I going to get? Charge, you know, charge yeah. for the food. Don't give it away. Yeah. And, and I think it's a very taboo thing to talk about. And maybe it's something that could be talked a little bit. And more I think openly. in the mentorship, go. This is what a base rate should be. This should be something. Because this year, I actually raised my rate substantially, and I've gotten more calls from different companies that are now taking me in. They're going, oh, now you're ready because you're charging this. You're willing to know your self worth to be worth this much. So money. know your value. Know know what you're bringing. Know to the your table. value. Yes, and and don't second guess it. You're going to know if you've screwed up. And you'll have... know if you raise your rate too much. Oh or you'll yes, get the instant you will. Feedback. <laughs> you, um, you'll get instant by not getting any. So last question, just um, Deb, you mentioned to me when we were talking kind of offline how. Um, you kind of have a very positive take on women in the industry and where things are going. So just real quick, if you could sum up, all three of you, what it's like to be a female in the industry, how can we get more women in the industry, and what do you see the future of the industry like uh, with women being a part of it? Um, well, when I started, I, and I heard you say in the, in the video earlier, um, you know, very few women. When I started, there were no women mm -hmm. except for me. And, you know, I walked in the door and they were like, The whole oh. market to yourself. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, nobody but me. <laughs> And um, I think at that time, my feeling was, I want to blend in. I just, I want to prove myself. I want to make, you know, be sure that I'm, I'm just as good as these guys in here and that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm worthy to be here um, was kind of my feeling, you know, don't, don't make any fuss, like don't ask for extra bathroom breaks, you know, this kind of thing. As women, you know, this is what the, the things that we think in our head. Um, but I think that, uh, especially recently, I've seen a lot more women out there. I've even done several shows that was all women and there were no men on the show. Um, just because, you know, maybe the executive yeah, you can clap was at that. a woman. That's great. I mean, that, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, maybe the, the executive was a woman or the production, the producer was a woman and she wanted to promote, you know, women in the industry and, and was making a concerted effort to do so. And, um, and I am seeing more and more, but I think the way to get more women in the industry is talk about what you do, talk about how much you love it, talk about the other things there are to do. And uh, you know, you see somebody that's um, a great secretary, but they're, they're bored and they're looking for something uh, a little more um, interesting. Say, hey, you know, have you ever thought about this interest industry? There are PAs. You can start as a PA and you're literally photocopying and making books and doing things, but you can learn so, so much just from being around all of the other roles. And also it's important, a lot of people think you have to be technical to be in this industry, mm -hmm. and right. you don't. You just have right. to have a great work ethic and you'll yes. become technical over time. Yes. Uh, Lisa. I say? hire a lot of women. I ran a crew for the Indy Racing League for 15 years and half of them were women. And First of all, you're down on a pit area, and I've got women running around in fire suits, and the guys are looking around at you like, where did they come from? And I did a show recently where somebody goes, yeah, there used to be these girls that used to run the racing thing. You know where they are? And I'm like, yeah, we've retired from that and moved on. And he goes, it was always enjoyable working with y'all because it was a different mentality. It wasn't the guy shoving the guy kind of thing. I always it was, felt it brought a good dynamic to show it does. It just it, kind of, it just was like a nice balance. Yeah, it's a nice balance. And it, it, you run into some interesting situations being on the road together like that, but it also proves you as a person because I don't look at it as a man woman thing. You're going to get into some kind of mess or something like that. As a person, how are you going to handle the situation? And as a person, what are you going to do with it? And it really did evolve, and I'm very, very good friends with those girls still to this day. They still call me. We're all still working in the industry, just in different little dynamics of it. Some of us are looking towards retirement, and the other ones are still digging at it. And it's out there. You just got to get out and fight for it. Right. Great. Cassandra, in 60 seconds or less, what do you think? Just be educated when you come into the industry. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to make it a red button. That's actually my fear, to make it a red button. Make it awkward for the men to go, we're women, we're going to burn our bras and come into your workplace, and we're going to be, we're going to be there, and, and better watch out for that sexual harassment if you say something sassy to me, mister. I, I hope that someday it's not even a red button. I hope that it's not even a conversation. Like when you started, you're saying no one was in the industry, basically. Now, I work on, a, on all crews that are mostly men, unless you're going into graphics and lighting, and I will say that, or wardrobe. Let's just be honest. It's a pigeonholed market in there. 
I hope this isn't even a red button. I hope that when my girls grow up in that generation, I hope that we can mentor the girls to think it's not even about you being a woman walking into the door. It shouldn't even be a concept that you're a woman walking through the door. You're just going to walk in as a tech, or you're going to walk in as a PA, or you're going to walk in as a human being, and you're just going to walk in and do the best that you can do, and that's all that should matter. It shouldn't be, I hope that that the stigma of being a girl or a woman walking into the industry doesn't even exist because it shouldn't exist. I think that all dissolves right away once people see the work ethic and the skill because I, I've seen uh, men and women that come into show site and they're, they're not prepared. So that, I think, most of the time, that's what you're judged on. Yes. And if you get in there, and, and like you said in the video, you get in there, you start pushing cases, yeah. you start working, you're, you're kind of the Johnny on the spot, whatever pretext or, that anybody might have on the crew will go away very quickly. Once they see, hey, I can, I can depend on this person, they've got my back, we're gonna get this show up and running. In and that's time. why I think it starts with us. It starts with us walking through the door and not being cocky, don't do it, but walking in and knowing what you're doing and not have that second guess. Knowing and going, I can do this, and just walking as if you've done it your whole life and make those mistakes and accept that failure and, and teach other women, you're gonna fail, and it's okay. Don't think because you're a woman you fail. Don't put that mindset even in the back of your head because you're a woman. You're a human being. You're a tech, you're a PA, you're gonna fail. I think the mindset shouldn't be put into the next generation, that it shouldn't even exist there. Because if we keep talking about women in the AV industry and getting more women in, I feel like we're gonna always have that thing in the back of our head of, should it be women or should it be people in the AV industry? And in that, we can hone in on the women and bring them in. Excellent answer. Well, thank you. Um, so with that, uh, Allison, are we gonna open it up for five minutes of questions or what do sure. you think? Sure, yeah. Does anyone have a question? Excellent. Let me come over. I'll be the uh, microphone person. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Hi. If you could introduce who you yes. are, who you're with, yes. that'd be great. Sure. My name is Andrea. I'm a student at Full Sail. I don't know if there's anybody else from Full Sail here. Cool. Yay. <laughs> Um, I fell into this completely by chance, literally. I went to do a entertainment business master's degree, and I, I'm a process expert in my former life. And I thought that the only way to learn the business was to work in the business, so that's what I started to do. So I saw myself in the situations that you described exactly. I had no clue what it was. Uh, I didn't even know that you had all these different functions, you know. I actually know what a barco is. I'm really proud, yay. <laughs> yes. And my question is access to the industry. Full Sail, obviously, is a secluded world where those opportunities are provided. You have all the courses, all the classes. But if you don't go to a university with that uh, mindset, how does one come into this, to the industry? Because I, I can see for myself, if I hadn't been at Full Sail, and if I wasn't interested in understanding the process part of it, I would never have realized that there was a humongous business. And even at Full Sail, we have very, a lot fewer girls than boys that actually go into the show pro. Well, this is the biggest program. problem, and that's why I always ask people um, this first question, which is, did you get into this industry on purpose? And 100% of the time, it's no. It's always, you never sit down with your high school guidance counselor and they say, hey, you know what? Live event production, you should look in it. Here's a pamphlet, you know. Um, it's, it's a really, everybody finds their way into this business by accident, correct? But it's not the live event production because I, you work on events, you know, distributing uh, tags and things like that. It's actually understanding that all these technical positions, I think that is the gap that I see because working in events, a lot of people help out, help out at school events and, and do, it's just a technical part. Lisa? As far as technical, you can put yourself into places where you can learn it fast. Um, every, in my world, every television show has a TV truck. Pick out what you're interested in, find the person doing that particular thing, shadow them, help them, hand them the tools, like mm -hmm. be a nurse. You need this, you need the tape, you need the, this kind of thing. I shadowed a guy that worked for the Ikigami company. There was a big recall on some cameras. I sat in a uh, sound stage with him for five and a half weeks and rebuilt computer cards. Free education, 100% free education. He took me on the road and I helped change out a whole system for him. So, Ask questions, be humble, that's the key, yeah, right? Just, yeah. Put yourself, there are people out there willing to give you a hand you just can't be rude about it, and you just show your interest. And 
they can tell if you're interested or you're just trying to buck in on something. And back when I, you know, I was the only woman in the technical side of live TV for a long time. I would start to meet camera women that came from TV stations and I was like, so what got you kind of like that? We would get discussions going. But the big thing was, is they were like, how did you do that without starting at a studio? And I said, I just, I forced myself, because deep in my heart when I was a kid, I kept watching the wide world of sports, and I'm like, I want to do that one day. And I made it. I really did. And it was, a, it was a cool day. And I think it's really what works for you. For me, I, I, I started with unions. Honestly, I started as a union with wardrobe and, and pushing boxes and just putting my resume out there, whatever it is. I mean, just put it out there. I, I flooded every email I could get a hold of. I know this might not be the best idea, so I'm not saying this is the best idea. But I flooded every email. I said, I, I will be the best cat herder you've ever seen. Because if anybody's run crews, you know you're herding cats. And so I, I just went into it going, I'll, I'll take what you can give me. And then while I was watching the boxes go by, I would go, all right, so that's an XLR. OK, that's this. And I learned those cables. And I, and I really digging the trenches for me, that's my, my journey. Everyone goes in a different journey. Digging those trenches and appreciating it as I moved up actually helped me mentor people. And it actually helped me build my skill and be able to find all those different things. But as you get into it, once you graduate, because Lord knows I wanted to go into business. I wanted to go into music business contracting. That's actually what I went to college for. I, I love ripping apart contracts. But then I got into concerts. Oh, you're going to pay me to see this concert? And then I went from concerts, and then someone said, oh, you could do corporate, and you can make this amount. Would you come and unload a truck? Or would you? And then you slowly being at the right place at the right time. I'm going to be honest. There are people in this industry that aren't technical at all. They were at the right place at the right time, and they took the opportunity. And it, a carpe diem is a true thing in this industry. It's OK not to know. Everybody starts green behind the ears, and I don't care who they are. I don't care what they put out there. They started in the trenches and just know that and go forward with it and just put your name out there. Before like getting your name out there. I, I would say um, to meet, I would say yeah. to meet as many people as you can in the industry and try to find someone that you feel is open to mentoring you and can give you advice and give you guidance and still be willing to do whatever you can are you, do. Are you in full sale? Are you in Tampa? I'm kind of the situation that I see. I'm a little older. I decided to change industries. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I will ask the cat anybody. I'm the yep. pesky person that asks the questions. You know, I'm the pesky person that asks the questions. I'm just like you. <laughs> yeah, be that he's, person. He's my mentor. But are, we but, have are, a consensus. but are you? But are you at? A, are you out of Tampa? My mentor, by the way. Are you out of Tampa? Where are you out of? I'm. I'm actually Brazilian Swedish, so I'm here just for this year. Where do you? you where Where you do you want to, to build your career? I don't want to build my career in the technical part. What I'm interested in is the involvement of young women in the industry. And that is why I asked the question. So I, I'm just like you. I asked the pesky questions. Yeah. And thank God I have people that want to answer them, which is amazing. Uh, but what we see is a lot more men, boys, mm -hmm. signing up for programs such as Showport, for example. Yes. So my question is, how do you motivate a girl, a 16, 17-year-old girl, to understand that this is a career for women? I've had a lot of people walk up to me during shows and ask me, how do you, how do you get a job doing this? And I'll tell them, personally, I think a college education that's where I kind of messed up maybe. I should have had more of a college education. But I went back to school and did learn a lot of things. But I tell them to check out their local colleges. And then if they're in high school, I go, surely you have an AV. Nowadays, every high school has an AV department, theater. I did drama in school. But I, have, I constantly have people walking up to me going, hey, how do you get a job like this? And I tell them that the bare facts, if I've got time, I'll give them a rundown on things. But you just got to ask. I'm He's, thinking that Allison, a, a VIXA AV club in uh, well, some of these yeah, art magnet like, schools I think, might yeah, be a I good think idea. The, the perfect solution here is exactly why we're all in this room. What we're doing, what you're looking to do, is exactly why every single one of us is in this room. This is the beginning of how we network, how we get to know each other. We continue it. We've got an advantage of Infocom being in Orlando, in our backyard. Take advantage of that. 
let's talk to each other, let's push each other, let's mentor each other. But as a, coming from the manufacturer side, to answer your question about especially the not college but high school, I want to take my company, and I would do this for any other company because I came from Barco. Go mm -hmm. Barco, love it, love that E2, <laughs> love it. mm, it's good times. Um, but it's, it's, I see the value and the benefit is going to, say, Dr. Phillips High School. Yep. It's phenomenal theater program. Those are gonna be a very connected, to go and start not only working with Valencia Community College, University of Central Florida, Full Sail University, but then also let's take it to the next next le level down and let's get with the high schools. So and I'll tell, manufacturer to I'll tell that. you this, I actually, my daughter, because obviously I have two of them and one was in elementary and they got a hold of me and they said, hey, you know audio, could you come in? And that became a platform I actually taught after school. That was my work-life balance. I taught a whole bunch of kindergartners through third graders how to mix a Mackie board. I literally had little kindergartners putting up and down little faders. They, I'm pretty sure they didn't quite get the concepts of the frequencies. Okay, like I'm gonna be honest, there was some squealing going on. But there, there, there's some of them graduating now that are coming back to me and going, hey, could I get a job there? Could I do this? I, I started at a young age. I taught theater, like it was, it was Bear Club is what it was. And I taught kids lighting. I had, I had Legos that I called local companies up and I said, I, I, need, I need lighting. I need audio, I need this, and I actually, when we installed the audio in, the kids actually came in and ran the XLRs with me. You can start really young, and then those kids tell, because they're more of an aha stage, like this is really cool, where high school they're like, God, I just wanna play video games, and I, and I wanna you know, get a job, and I wanna get out of my house, and blah, blah, blah. I started young, where they were like telling their kids, like, did you hear I ran audio? Did you hear I ran lighting? I did wardrobe? I think you could even start at that young of an age and go into schools, but it starts with us. It's us taking our time and having that work with the kids, even not having kids and, and traveling and telling, I think that's well, the Well, that's not part. also, we gotta remember one thing too. This is a young industry. Yeah. So it would be a lot easier if there were generations of, uh, beyond us that figured all this out and they laid the groundwork and they had the mentorships and they built the colleges that taught AB. We're the ones that have to do that, which I think is exciting, but it's also a little bit scary as well. Excellent question. I, we hope have another we, I hope we address it. I think we have, we have, we have time for one another, more, one or two another more. Another one right here, real quick. Excellent so, beard, by the way. I work, at, I work at Full Sail. I run the live venue. Andrea is one of the students that I have working in the venue from an entertainment business degree. We've taught her how to engineer a show. She's going to engineer a, a live television production in a couple weeks. She's directing. She's producing events for us. We're teaching her that stuff and other students as well. But how did you get past the self-doubt? She's amazing. She's I don't. so good, but I suck she it up, Buttercup. That's what I tell that. myself. I listen to angry women music on the way here, and he had to listen to it in the car. I, I listen to Kesha Woman when I came into here, if you even know that song. I, I, some people probably could get past that self doubt, but I will tell you every time I send out that, that email, I, I got called for, I'm going to start with a new company at the end of this month. They called me, they came to me and said, hey, we might need your S3. We want you to do this. Here's all your stuff. I got the email, and I'm pretty sure I sat there for a second and went, oh my God, what am I do I say yes or do I say I'm booked? Do I say I'm booked or do I say yes? I truly believe if you can hone in into your self-doubt and use it as a tool to move forward and accept that everybody in the room has self-doubt. And it took me a very long time, but someone that was in the industry for a very long time, and he passed away. He was my mentor originally. He got in a motorcycle accident and died when I got out of college. He told me everybody in the room has self-doubt. Everybody questions themselves in this, in this industry. No matter what they tell you to your face, they question their ability, they question everything. But it's that moment of making that decision and standing firm with yourself and going, if I screw up with this, I'm gonna screw up with it 100%. And I'm gonna learn from it and I'm gonna fail and I'm gonna fall on my face and then I'm gonna wash it off when I'm done. But asking those questions, and it's, it's gonna be hard, but it's knowing that you're gonna make those mistakes and accepting and finding those people that you have found to mentor you that'll go, you're amazing, and we're behind you, even in your self-doubt. Because I still have it. I mean, I've only been at it for a while. You've been in it longer, but it, I feel like I've always, I will have that. And self-educate. I mean, mm -hmm. if you feel like you're not strong at a certain thing on those days when you're off, take the time and, and go, you know what, I'm going to figure this out so that the next time I go on site and I'm asked to do this, I know how to do it. I mean, as long as I've been doing it, this, software still changes. I'm like, 
damn it, I know this tool is here somewhere, but where did they put it now? <laughs> you know, and, and so it's just taking that time to be kind to yourself and go, you know what, I'll figure it out, I'm smart, I know what I'm doing, and if there is something I don't understand, I'm gonna go learn it, so that the next time, I don't have to be worried about that. And I'm, every one of those road cases they push in, 90% of the time there's a book in there. Take it to lunch, I'm serious. And, and you surround yourself with people that know. I know when I'm a, a video person, sometimes my graphics person goes, oh, it's that button. And I go, thank you. Because believe it or not, just because somebody's in graphics doesn't mean they don't switch. Or someone's a switcher doesn't mean they don't do graphics. There, there are true people in the industry that will help you wherever you're at. If you can find those people, cling on to those people, because it's great not being the smartest person in the room. You want to surround yourself with those people. All right, we had, I think this will be probably our last question. One more, yeah. One more, one sure. more. Might be a good segue. Um, I'm Erica. I work with uh, Mertz Crew, and I, for a very long time, was the person calling you guys and begging you to work. <laughs> so um, I come from labor coordinating, <laughs> um, and I know a few people do here. Um, what I'm interested in learning um, is, as a coordinator and as someone that gets feedback from account executives and people that really want to book specific people and specific jobs. Uh, what I found is that techs get pigeonholed very quickly into one thing and one thing only. And no matter what I do with a resume or no matter what the coordinator does with, I know this person, I trust them, we can't get that mindset out of the AE. So what is it that you guys do or what are the things that you think that maybe people that are in those roles can do to benefit you to promote you better? Great question. I can answer that one real quick because a lot of the people that I work with uh, want to move up to be camera people. Or me, I want to be an engineer, or work on a truck. Women, they don't really like on the trucks. I quit. You have to. You have to quit taking utility jobs. Mm -hmm. You have to quit taking audio jobs. You have to go, no, I'm doing camera, I'm focusing on camera. And you stay with that objective. I've got a very dear friend. I never understood why he was a utility. He was an amazing camera guy. And he goes, what do I do? And I'm like, quit. And he was just like, you have to take the mindset, get yourself ready for it, quit accepting the utility jobs, and move to the camera position. You have to. I would concur 100%. You have to say no to say yes. And it's scary. I put, when, they, when I was told that, I was told that by very high people in the industry. They said, you have to learn to say no. And I went, you don't understand, my water needs to say yes to that bill. Like that, they don't care where I get that money from, that bill needs to get paid. But it might dip for a second. But it might dip, but it up. comes back, and that's, that's the fear, just like even upping your rate. Like that was my fear this year. I upped my rate and I went, here you go, hold on to my seat. I know someone ramen. that was doing camera, and then they started learning video engineering, and he came to me, I was kind of mentoring him a little mm -hmm. bit, and he's like, look, what do I do? I'm like, you have to stop taking camera calls because then people will only see you as a camera operator, they won't see you as a video engineer. Not that one's better than the other, but eventually you have to say, look, I want to progress, yeah. I want to be in the hot seat, so I'm not, gonna take, I'm not gonna just take calls because what happens is you get on show site and you're like, that guy was switching my show last week and now he's, he's taping down cables, that's kind of weird, yeah. right? So eventually you just have to say, nope, I'm done, starting October 1st, this is over. I'm just gonna be a projectionist. Now what that say, I still tape floors. I will I still go in, I will too. be a great Straight, box pusher. Right edge. Or but, but to not right pigeonhole edges. yourself, yes, you have, to, you have to say no, and it's scary. Sometimes it's scary, and then once you get yourself out of that pigeonhole, sometimes you can go and ta say yes. I, ta I say yes, I'm like, sure, I'll go do it. I have a day off sometimes. It, that's it's, that's so easy ahead. for us to say, right, because we all have a lot of work. But it, somebody that maybe like if you stopped at like like if tomorrow you wanted to be a stage manager but you'd never stage managed before you can't really quit your bread and butter, um, you know. So for, that's what I did. I, I wanted to stage manage. So what I started doing the clients that I was really close to, I started saying, hey, by the way, I'm thinking about stage managing. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about stage managing. Six eight months later, hey, by the way, I've been stage managing. Hey, I stage managed this really successful show last week. Let me tell you about it. And it just kind of snowballs from there. And the more that you kind of put that bug in people's ear, if they trust you and they believe that you've done the work, that you have the skill to be able to do that job and do it well, then they will give you those opportunities. And the first time you do it and you do a great job, they're like, what was I even worried about? You know, and then they'll to tell two friends and so on. 
Great point to end on. Great panel. Can we get a big round of applause for these ladies? Excellent job.